All right, good morning again. We doing all right? All right, good stuff. Well, we are starting a new series today uh, on the genealogy, sorry, not the genealogy of Jesus. We're not a whole series on the genealogy, just a sermon on the genealogy. We're starting a new series today uh, called uh, The Gospel According to Jesus, and it's basically going to be a dive into the Gospel of Matthew. Now, doing a new sermon series at the beginning of Lent is not unheard of for us. Uh, what will be different this year is that we will be going through Easter. Rather than stopping the series on Easter, we'll actually be going forward on through Easter and into the early summer months. And so the way that we're going to break this down walking through the Gospel of Matthew is we're going to take a, a run at some key events in the life of Jesus and talk about him as king. And then end that sort of sub-series on Easter Sunday with the resurrection. And then we're going to go back into the Gospel of Matthew for the months following Easter and talk about what is this kingdom. If you have a king, you have a kingdom, what does he establish? What's the ethic of this kingdom? What's it like? And so we're going to look at some of his miracles, some of his teachings, and talk about uh, the king and his kingdom after that. And so when you talk about kings... To an American audience, there's a little bit of a disconnect. We don't have a king, and if I know my history correctly, we don't want one either. And so when we hear the word king, we do not think of a positive image. Our idea of a king would be something presidential, someone restrained by other institutions. An absolute monarch is like our worst nightmare as a people. We don't have a concept of a benevolent, singular, absolute ruler. It's something we've pushed against. And so when you think of Jesus as king, it can be a little difficult for us to relate to that. And what's more is what we know about kings and what we believe about kings is that they don't really relate well to us either. The, the kings in the palace, the kings in the, in the kingdom or in the castle, he doesn't know what the every man's going through. He doesn't know what the day-to-day -day life of the woman is like because he's so far removed. And so what I want to do today is as we look at the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1, is I want to actually make an argument that Jesus actually knows exactly what our lives are like and that Jesus is not this far removed king saying like Marie Antoinette, let them eat cake, but rather that Jesus is close and he understands and he's there with us. He's not a distant ruler, but he's close by. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to look at his history. Now, I don't know how much you know about uh, uh, heraldry and then the way in which kings inherit titles, but you would always look for like a really good match, a dynastic match, when you got married and you would inherit titles. And so by the time you get to the Victorian era, the kings and queens of those days had these massive long list of names like duke and such of such and such, count of this and that, king of so and so with this and that, and the knight of the holy order of the sacred slipper, all sorts of stuff. And these lengthy titles. And so what I want us to do today is I want us to give Jesus four titles. We're going to make up four titles that he inherits out of his genealogy that gives us his, him every right to rule and reign over us in our lives. The first title I'd like to bestow upon Jesus today is he's the king of superstars. He's the king of superstars. Verse 1, chapter 1, reads this. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Skip down to verse 6. And Jesse the father of David the king, and David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. We live in an age of celebrity. Now people have always been attracted to the rich, the powerful, uh, the people of status. They made pharaohs in ancient Egypt, they called them gods, right? We've always built statues to generals and people that have contributed great things to history. We like celebrities. We're kind of drawn to them as a human condition. I don't know why, but we are. But in our day and age, we live in an unprecedented ability to actually access celebrities. A long time ago, and by a long time ago, I mean when I was a kid, there was this show that was hosted by Robin Leach called Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. And you would get to go into like these people's houses and see the way the rich people lived. Then they updated it on MTV and they called it Cribs. And it was super cool then too. 
And nowadays, you have social media. You can see what your favorite celebrity had for lunch. And I don't know for the life of me why we want that, but we do. And what's more is you can interact with your favorite celebrity. You can actually tweet at them. There's actually this new thing. I love this. My wife and I discovered it recently. It's called Cameo. You can apparently give celebrities who have money more money. And they will record a short video to somebody for like their birthday or their, your wedding anniversary. You can, you, know, you can get like LeBron to be like, hey, happy birthday. I bet you've got to pay him like thousands of dollars, but he might do it for you. We have unprecedented access. This week alone, when, when Ukraine lost all their Wi-Fi, a bunch of people like tweeted at Elon Musk and he adjusted a satellite and gave the whole of Ukraine Wi-Fi. Can we talk about that? It's crazy. We have unprecedented access. And these people, the Bezoses, the Musks, the Kennedys, heaven help us, the Kardashians, they seem to operate on this different level. They seem to have this different standard of living than we do. And we think about who would be a king over them, who would have rule and power over them. This, Elon Musk has a satellite. Who's going to tell him what to do? But look at this list, this genealogy in Jesus' life. Look at the people we just listed. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. These men founded not just a religion, but a people group that still exists today. The Jewish people. David. David isn't, look at it in verse 6. It says, Jesse the father of David the king. Not King David, Ki David the king. That's like a hip-hop name. He's the king, right? Solomon, the wisest person to ever live. He may be the wealthiest person to ever live. Bottom line, these guys are giants. And I don't mean giants of our faith. They are. But they're giants of human history. They're basically legendary in human history. I was watching a soccer match this week between a really, really uh, uh, high-class club, high, uh, top, top-tier club, and a really, like, bottom-tier club. And everybody, what's the first thing they said? It's a real David and Goliath match today. David the king. He's a superstar. People were writing books about Solomon, legends about his wealth and wisdom as late as the 1800s. These people are legendary. They're huge. They're giants. If you want to pick any marker of success you want, entrepreneur, founders, literature, art, music, wealth, power, strength. These five men have it all and adjusted for inflation to a greater degree than probably anybody else who's ever lived. And now I want you to think about how you fit into this. We collectively are some of the wealthiest people who have ever lived. In some ways, this is a golden age, a golden age of information, self-determination, equality. I know that not everything is equal. We still have a long way to go in many areas, but comparatively speaking to the rest of history, this truly is a golden age. We have come very far. This is the most civilized civilization has ever been. We are the superstars of history. We have it so much better. There's air conditioning in this room right now, and it's amazing. Some people in this room grew up using the bathroom in an outhouse. That would be absolutely unheard of today in our modern society. Now think about yourself as an individual. The power, the influence, the status, the wealth that you've accumulated over time. Some of you are leaders in your business, you're leaders in your community, you're leaders in this church. You have a great deal of power and influence. Jesus is the king of superstars. But you might sit there and be, Travis, come on. He was a Jewish peasant that lived 2,000 years ago. How does he know what it's like to have wealth, status, power, and influence? Well, do you, are you familiar with the expression old money? Old money is like money that you inherit 
over several generations, right? The Carnegies are old money. The Vanderbilts are old money. The Rockefellers, Queen Elizabeth is old money. Old money. She's very stately. Look at the names on here. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Solomon. Jesus is old money. Old money. Now, he may not have, when he was on earth, he may not have had the wealth, but he had the title. He had the aristocracy. He had the blood. He's old money. And what's more, let's just go ahead and use a biblical expression. There's another king of superstars-like name that Jesus actually uses. And you know what it is? King of kings. David was the king. Jesus is the king of the kings. And so when we sit here in this day and age where we have it all together and we're so full of power and influence and one of the most powerful nations to ever exist, Jesus says, I know what it's like to rule and to reign. I know what it's like to have power. I know what it's like to be tempted to abuse my power for selfish desires. I know what it's like to have the best intentions. I know what it's like to know exactly what the right thing is to do with the power that I have, and I know what it's like to know what's best for everybody, but to be absolutely opposed by the people around me, by people who don't get it. I know what it's like to be forced out. I know what it's like to be kicked out. I know what it's like to have power and then lose it all. That is an expression, another one. It's lonely at the top. And Jesus says, I know what that's like. Because the top led him to the top of a hill at the top of a cross. Because his power led him to lay it aside for the salvation and the flourishing of those around him. For all of humanity. For all the earth. And so I know many of you feel like you're lonely at the top. You might feel lonely in your place of power and status. Why? Because when you're at the top, people are gunning for you. People want, waiting for you to fall off the top, however that looks, so that they can take your spot. But if you submit your life to Christ, it's no longer lonely at the top because there's a king with you. There's another ruler leading and guiding you. Now, fair warning, he will lead you to use your power in ways that you will never consider. It'll lead to sacrifice it will lead to the flourishing of those around you, of building up people in your sphere of influence. Your power will not be for you to accrue more power, but for you to divest that into the lives of other people because that's what Jesus did with him because he waited on the Father to lift him up. And you'll wait on the King of Kings to lift you up as well. And that's how we use our power. That's how superstars in Christ use their power. Now you might say, Travis... Shocking revelation here, an aristocrat who wants to hang out with other aristocrats, big surprise. Well, there's other titles in Jesus' genealogy that we can look for. Jesus is also the king of outsiders. Look at verse three. And Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez, the father of Hezron, and Hezron, the father of Ram, and Ram, the father of Amenadab, and Amenadab, the father of Nashon, and Nashon, the father of Salmon, and Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of David the king, and David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. Skip down to verse 16. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who was called the Christ. Now, one of the things that should jump off the page to you in this genealogy is that there are five women listed, four of them by name. There's Tamar, there's Rahab, there's Ruth, there's Bathsheba, who's not named, and there's Mary. Now, obviously, in the ancient world, women were not uh, included in much of the uh, established power structures. They were excluded in the ancient world, particularly in Judaism. In Judaism, women were not allowed to be priests. They were not allowed to be kings, and they were not allowed to be soldiers. Those are three high-powered structures that women were excluded from. And even though there's some exceptions of women being powerful and influential, such as Deborah, Abigail, Esther, the reason why they stand out is because they were exceptions to the rule. These women were outsiders. 
It only got worse in, worse in the intertestamental period, in the period uh, 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament. The rabbinical tradition kicked in. And the rabbis, despite their best, uh, perhaps with the best of intentions in mind, I'm not sure, continued to exclude women from the halls of power, culminating in this gym, the spite of a man is better than the kindness of a woman. That was something the rabbis actually wrote and believed. And so by the time that Jesus shows up, by the time Matthew's genealogy is written, or sorry, Jesus' genealogy is written by Matthew, women had very little power and significance and influence. But this is not just the inclusion of women as outsiders for the sake of including them as outsiders. These women were outsiders in many other different ways as well. They had to go outside the bounds of established power in order to change the world. Tamar was Judah's daughter-in-law. And without getting into the story, you can read it. It's in Genesis. Tamar marries one of Judah's sons. That son dies. Another son dies. And she's supposed to be given in marriage to the third son, the last of the sons. And Judah refuses because he basically thinks that she's the problem, right? And so Tamar dresses up like a prostitute, waits by the side of the road, seduces her father-in-law, sleeps with him, gets pregnant by him, and Judah decides, well, you are an unrighteous woman, we're going to kill you. And Tamar produces evidence that he's the father. It's like a soap opera. And Judah says, you're more righteous than I am. Rahab, we know, was a prostitute. We believe she was a prostitute. She saved her whole family from an invading Israelite army because she recognized that God was at work. Ruth was a Moabite woman, not even an Israelite, who follows Christ or follows God and becomes a faithful follower. Bathsheba is seduced by David, suffers the loss of a child and a husband, but becomes the father of King Solomon. And Mary, well, we all know Mary. These women, despite flaws, despite bad choices by people in their lives, but despite their own bad choices, despite bad circumstances and bad leadership, they all changed the course of history. Without knowing it, they were going to be the grandmothers of the greatest person to ever live. But for most of their lives, they functioned as outsiders. And many of you, that's where you are today. You're a functional outsider because of your race, your ethnicity, your social status, your economic status, your age, your skill set, your education, your background, your criminal history, you are an outsider. And I have very good news for you today. Jesus is your king. Jesus is the king of outsiders because Jesus inherits this title from the five women in his genealogy. He inherits the title of outsider from them. In fact, Jesus was the ultimate outsider He's rejected constantly by the establishment, both political and religious. He's rejected by his own disciples when they don't like what he has to say. He's even so much of an outsider that they physically kill him outside of the city. And by the way, it was his own people doing the executing. It's very hard, it's very difficult for a person to be an outsider. But Jesus allowed himself to become an outsider. Why? Why did he allow himself to be in this position? You've heard of the expression, the glass ceiling, right? It's just, uh, usually talked about with women and equality, breaking the glass season, uh, ceiling for uh, equality in wages and things like that. But there was a ceiling for us as a people because we were on the outside looking in on a relationship with God. And despite our best efforts, despite our best, uh, our goodest, our best intentions, our, our best efforts, You cannot do enough good things to break that ceiling and God to accept you based on your own merit. It doesn't work like that. And so the Son of God puts on flesh. He shatters that glass ceiling by his crucifixion, his burial, and his resurrection. And he reaches a hand back through and he offers to lift us back up, to lift us up where we're supposed to be in a right relationship with the Father. And all you have to do is trust him. All you have to do is trust him and take his hand and let him lift you up. You don't have to do anything but trust and be an outsider no more, but to be an insider in the most important way possible inside the family of the risen Savior, the King of Kings. Now you're an aristocrat. Welcome to the family. Welcome to the party. But that has responsibility on it as well. 
Because now when we see people around us who are outsiders, we reach out to them as well. We have the ministry of reconciliation. We have the ministry of bringing people in. We don't sit idly by why they are excluded. No, we go to them. The people who are cut off, the people who are cut out, we reach out to them. Whoever that is in your life, maybe there's a family member that the rest of the family cannot stand. Guess who's your new best friend? That person. Maybe there's a coworker who's flawed and doesn't do a good job and everybody else kind of resents them because they somehow still have a job. Guess who's your new partner on the next project? You reach out and you include them, reaching out to the outsiders because that's what our king did for us. And if we're his subjects, if we follow his rulership, then we have to be like him because this is what the church has done for 2,000 years, including the outsiders. Now, you may not be a superstar. You may not be an outsider. You may just be somebody who has squandered the opportunities that God has given them. And Jesus is king for you as well. He's the king of failures. Look at verse 7. And Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam, the father of Abijah, and Abijah, the father of Asaph, and Asaph, the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat, the father of Joram, and Joram, the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah, the father of Jotham, and Jotham, the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh, the father of Amos, and Amos, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconiah, and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. This is, these are all kings, every single one of them. Solomon is the only king of a united Israel. The rest are kings of Judah. And despite the fact that some of these names on here are really godly men, there's also some really terrible names in here as well. In fact, as a collection, we can say that, each, that these men together are failures. They're failures. For every Uzziah, Hezekiah, and Josiah, there's a Jotham, and Ahaz, and a Manasseh. In fact, the evil kings were so evil and they made Judah so bad that when a good king came along, he couldn't be good enough for long enough to get the rot out of his kingdom. And by the time he died, guess what? They went right back to the things they were doing before. They were so evil in idolatry and immorality and oppression that God sometimes said, you are worse than the neighbors, the pagan kingdoms around you. That's how bad it was. By any measure you want to throw out these men were failures. Some of them, sure, started off great. Even the good ones started off great. Solomon started off strong, finished as a sex-addicted polytheist. Jehoshaphat made regular alliances with Ahab and with Jezebel, the kings and queens of Israel. Uzziah was given leprosy after usurping a priestly responsibility. Hezekiah was so proud, he showed Babylonian envoys his uh, throne room, his treasure room, and they became jealous for for. Judean gold, Jewish gold, and they conquered the kingdom because of it. Josiah was slain in battle in an ill-advised attempt to stop Egypt. Any measure you want to throw out politically, economically, spiritually, these men as a whole were failures. They tried to stop the decay of their kingdom and they didn't. They collectively ran the kingdom of David and Solomon so far into the ground that other than a short little 40-year-old window, for 2,500 years there was not an independent Jewish state until the modern-day Israel was founded. That is next-level failure. That's like Cleveland Browns failure. <laughs> it's bad. And failure has a massive part to play in everybody's history, both personal and corporate. All of us have had to deal with failure. All of us. Some of us are so afraid of failure that we won't try anything new. Some of us have a great deal of fa failure in our past. It's like a weight that won't allow us to pursue anything new. Some of us struggle with an addiction that seemingly uh, erodes every attempt we have to genuinely follow Christ. And then there are those of us who are right now can only describe the season of life we're in as feeling like one colossal failure. Failure is a part of the human condition, and here's why. Because sin is a part of the human condition. Sometimes it's our sin that causes us to fail. Sometimes it's somebody else's sin. Sometimes it's generations of sin. You come from a long line of failures. Sometimes it's just the fallen world that we live in. 
And some of us, when we think of Jesus, the son of God, we think he only wants superstars and outsiders in his kingdom, and he doesn't want failures. If he does want failures, if he's interested at all in having a failure, it's that, it's that first time you come to Christ failure, right? It's like, oh, you, you, you walk an aisle, you get baptized, and all of heaven's like, woo, yeah, failure coming down, not a failure anymore. And then you got, a, you, you got saved at a young age, and you got to live the rest of your life, and there's a whole lot of failure left. And you get to be my age, or older, and you begin to think to yourself, I bet Jesus is really disappointed in me. I bet I'm not what he thought I would be when I got saved at such a young age. Or I bet he, I'm not what I, he thought I would be when I got saved last week. I bet I'm a big disappointment. It's not how Jesus looks at you. Jesus is the king of failures. Jesus died for failures. You know what 2 Corinthians 5.21 says? I think this is actually Jeff's favorite verse. He says, for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I'm gonna repurpose this a little bit. Eugene Peterson did it with the message. I can, I can tinker a little bit today. For our sake, he made him to be a failure who knew no failure, so that we might become the picture of God's success. Sin isn't just failure, it's not. Sometimes failure isn't a sin at all, it's just failure. And success is not righteousness. But if we, in fact, are failures, because of our sin, because of our brokenness, if we failed to be what God has made us to be, Christ comes and redeems us and rescues us and makes us into the successes. Not our success, though. Evidence, trophies of God's creative and redemptive plan for creation. We're trophies. God desires us to display us proudly in his trophy room of eternity and say, look what the greatness and the glory of God did. When I was a kid, I used to run track. I was real little. And you would get ribbons when you finished in a certain place. And so if you got first place, it was blue. If you were second place, it was red. If it was third place, it was white. If it was fourth place, it was green. Clearly I remember, and I think I need to talk to somebody about how formative this was in my life. Because clearly it's been weighing on me. But I had a friend of mine and we would run track together and we weren't interested in winning races. You know what we wanted to do? We wanted to get a different color ribbon every time. We wanted to get all the colors of the rainbow. That's what we thought it was about. Now I didn't throw any races. I'm just saying I got excited when I got a green ribbon. Some of us think that Jesus only wants blue ribbons. Jesus only wants the best. And Jesus is like seven-year-old Travis running track. He wants one of everybody. He wants everyone in his trophy room of grace. That's you and that's me and he displays you proudly as a testimony of his grace and his glory. Now there's something in our culture that's worse than being a failure, worse than being an outsider and it is the opposite of being a superstar. It's being a nobody, and Jesus is the king of those too. Look at verse 12. And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah of the father of Shealtiel, and Shealtiel the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel the father of Abiud, and Abiud the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim the father of Azor, and Azor the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Achim, and Achim the father of Eliud, and Eliud the father of Eliezer, and Eliezer the father of Mathan, and Mathan the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. So after you hit the exile in verse 11, there's a lot of names, and other than Zerubbabel, we don't know anything about any of them. And this isn't just Travis didn't have time to do the research, and so I'm telling you we don't know anything about them. Like, we don't know anything about them. There's nothing in the prophecies about them. There's no extra biblical literature that we've discovered yet. There's nothing other than Zerubbabel. He shows up a few times. These men may have been great men of power, of influence. They may have been community leaders. They may have even been godly men. In fact, there's probably good reason to think some of them were because Joseph is such a godly man that he had to learn it from somewhere. But the truth of the matter is, 
we don't know. For you and for me, you have better luck going out to Sparkman Hillcrest and walking around randomly and picking a tombstone and finding information about somebody out there than we do about somebody in this genealogy. They're nobodies to us. That's not who they were then, but they are for us now. And so this raises the question, why are they listed in Jesus' genealogy and why in the world are they the inspired word of God? Well, one of the roles of the king of ancient Israel was to be a shepherd to his people. And Jesus says he's the great shepherd. In John 10, 27, he says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Sheep are not very remarkable. If you were to let me play all day, which I don't know why we would do this, but let's just say for the sake of argument, if I were to play with a sheep all day long, just one sheep, become best friends with the sheep, and then you were to turn said sheep loose back into a pen of a hundred other sheep and ask me to find my best friend sheep, I would fail. Why? Because they all look alike. They're puffy clouds on four legs with a head. That's it. They have no discernible markings. Nothing. That's why we put little tags in their ears so we know which one's which. But a good shepherd knows his sheep. Even though somebody from the outside thinks they're nobodies, even if the sheep thinks it's a nobody, the good shepherd knows his sheep. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. The good shepherd lays down his life for a flock of nobodies. And you might be like, wow, Travis, finishing strong on an encouraging note today. Thanks for calling me a nobody. (laughs) You may feel like a nobody. You may feel unimportant, unlooked for, insignificant. You may feel forgotten by others, left out by them. You may feel like you haven't made a significant contribution to history. You may not enter into the hall of fame or be sculpted on the side of a mountain. And to be honest with you, probably most of us in this room, once you get past our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, people probably won't even remember your name. But there is one person, the king of nobodies, and he has a book. And if you were a follower of Christ, if you have come to know him, you, your name is in his book and he remembers you. You're not a nobody to him. You're not a nobody to the most important person to ever live, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the king of nobodies. You're very important to him. And do not think of yourself and other people as insignificant because the precious blood of Christ was spilled for the insignificant, the blood that was carried in this genealogy.